Have a seat, amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise. going to be there. So y'all come expecting to see good night every Thursday. But now I'm bound to, to give you and to say amen because God is a God of order. So when I jump into a series, I'm obligated to fulfill what I said I would do. So that's why I don't like doing this, but I will say that I'm excited to do this tonight. I think the Lord had a place spiritually. is when we just kind of roll through the literature that you're studying and get responsive to it, okay? So we're just going to go through the Bible. Our topic is John, and we're going to try that every word is from the gospel according to John, okay? Brother Andrew, or Brother Justin, you may have the night off. Brother John, you may have the night off. Please join the crowd, and, and let's enjoy this. Y'all get me in trouble. Pick your Bible up. Now shake it in the devil's face. Amen. So are you ready for tonight? This is why I like the gospel according to John. Some of that picked me up. Am, am I correct? Thank you, Andrew. Remind me because by the end of the evening. The gospel according to John is a non-synoptic gospel. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic. It's a Greek word. Sign, seen, or optic, seen, sign, together, seen, together. They mimic each other. But then we have John's gospel, which is a wild card. Y'all know I like wild cards. So we have John's gospel, which is different. It's not near of the same, although you'll see 
touch points throughout all four Gospels. You'll see things that are very similar. We lost some light there, Pastor. There we go. Mm. And, and it's you see the lights fluctuate, and everybody wave at Andrew in the back. Wave at Alyssa sitting at the door. Y'all see this high dollar camera we have sitting up right there where she's sitting? So what they're going to be doing is trying to watch the live stream and adjust the lighting so it looks presentable, okay? So if the light is timed up, it's not the Holy Spirit, okay? But I like John. Are you ready to rock? John was the last gospel that was wrote. was the very last gospel to be written. A lot of people contribute the gospel of John to the point of where does it end? It shows by the end of this, this series, and maybe the, the tradition that you have saw is not correct. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you that there's not just John and the twin brothers and the brother of John. Here's some things to note. There's seven I am statements that John makes in his gospel. Seven perfect number of I am statements, which will have touch points with the name of God, Yahiah Asher, Yahiah I am that I am. He also gives us seven signs. You need to write that down. Signs or miracles that may point to something. What are the signs anyway? We're going down the road. It tells you where you're going. It gives you direction. He gives us seven signs throughout his gospel. Here's some other notable things. He lists no birth, no genealogy, no transfiguration. And you'll notice also in the gospel of John that he gives you no exorcism stories or demon casting or devils. And the reason that he does this, and I want you to grab this now, is because he's designed his gospel, that the whole gospel is a huge exorcism story of how Jesus has come to drive out sin. All right? John also structures his gospel. It's called an inclusio. Write that down. Don't ask me how to spell that. I-N-C-L-U-S-I-O. Inclusio. Inclusios are bookends. I know not many people have bookshelves anymore. But you remember when you stayed in school, if the, I, if, if the row wasn't filled up in the bookshelf, they had a thing that you slid up in the book. Bookends are what inclusios are. They hold the story in place. All right? John's gospel is an inclusio. And they throw it from the first chapter all the way to the last chapter. How it's a story inside of a story. Get ready. Chapter 1, I told you that John structures his gospel in a beautiful way. John's brilliant. That's why I love this gospel. He is a brilliant writer. He is a very educated man. This is the most theological gospel that there is out of the four. Okay? But he structures his gospel, and write this down, because as when you start seeing how John has structured his gospel, it's going to tell you the story. Get ready. Chapter 1 is about creation. Chapters 2 through 4 reference the patriarchs. Chapters 5, 6, and 7 reference the exodus. Chapters 8 and 9. Am I going too fast? Okay, where are we at? Chapter 1, creation. Hello, is it God? Thank you. Amen. Miss Jane, Jesus on the main one. Chapters 2 through 4 talk about the patriarchs. And they focus, they give focus on Jacob. Write that down. Chapters 5, 6, 7 focus on the exodus. Chapters 8 and 9, are y'all caught up? Focus on sin. Chapters 10 and 11, focus on the exile. Do I need to slow down a minute? 
eight and nine sin, ten and eleven. They they're referencing exile. Chapters twelve and thirteen. Chapters fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, and seventeen. Are you caught up with me? Everybody need to slow down a minute. Fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, and seventeen focus on the mission that Jesus has come to accomplish. 14, 15, 16, and 17. They focus on what Jesus has come to this earth to accomplish, what he has come to do. And chapter 18 focuses on the crucifixion and how it's got there. One, creation, two, and two through four, patriarchs, five, six, seven, Exodus, chapters 8 and 9, focus on sin, 10, 11, focus on the exile, chapters 12 through 13, return from exile, 14, 15, 16, and 7, what Jesus has came to do, and 18 on the crucifixion. Now, if you look at that list in linear fashion, it tells the story of the entire gospel. John goes back from the very beginning, and in his gospel, hidden there in plain sight, he tells the story of the entire Bible up until the time of the end where he tells it kind of in parable or parables as you like to call them which means to be thrown to the side it's not a direct thing but a parable is something that is tossed to the side that way it makes somebody that's reading it kind of think and as Jesus says yeah I understand what you're saying Jesus says to him if you see it you'll believe it so y'all ready write this down the theme is new creation that's the main theme new creation that's the main thing that John he's he's hanging his hat on there's some other smaller things that he focuses on which is knowledge towards the giver of light versus darkness okay y'all ready chapters 1 and verse 1 in the beginning was the word special word and the word was with God. Circle that second word, word. And the word was God. Right there we have a threefold repetition of a word that means word. Right? And somewhere in Old Testament writings, especially once I reveal to you who John, who, who John is, not John the son of Zebedee, but the unknown disciple that he calls himself. And as we go through this first chapter, we're going to find out that this is one of two gospels that is wrote from an eyewitness point of view. Matthew and John. They're the only two gospels that's, that, that have, was wrote from first-hand experience. Mark, John Mark, is probably the assistant of Peter and probably got his information from him. Luke, well, he come along right after the death and got all his information from the disciples Paul had heard from all these things. So John is an eyewitness, but listen to what he says. In the beginning, oh, that sounds like the beginning. Genesis what? One and one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. See, John is pulling your mind back to creation, which this first chapter is all about. In the beginning was the Word. Old Testament says that the Word has to do with light and power. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now, y'all get the cutest thing in Mark. Come on now. I'm going to come on in a minute. I'm getting ahead of myself. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything that was made. In him. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Mm. So we have the creation in Genesis 1-1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and it was void, and God spoke, and there was light, and then at 186,000 miles per 
second one. <laughs> but then he looked and he said, you know what? I know that I didn't know I got to make somebody to teach me, to work with me, so I can be in relationship with him. So he created a dawn. The light that shines in darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man. I want y'all to circle that. Circle that man. There was a man. See, in Ephesians, the Gospel of John, he points us right to that truth. I love that. He breaks that and really teaches the Trinity. We, we look at this right here. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light. Remember, light versus dark is the main theme that we're going with. That all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. John has this way of showing us the Trinity has one ECM, three hypostasis. Tommy works at FedEx. He's a friend of mine. He said, man, you two are combining now, right? You got FedEx ground. You got FedEx Air, FedEx Freight, but at the end of the day, they all FedEx, okay? At the end of the day, they're all one same thing. They just operate in different capacities. So even though we believe in the Trinity, there is no denying that Jesus was God put on flesh because he said that John about the light. And in this light, through that light, all things was created. But if we read back in Genesis 1, God created all things. So John is telling us the same one in Genesis that spoke out of his mouth is the same one that's going to come and dwell among men. So much, and I will tell you, listen to me, I have been blessed with good neighbors and some mighty scholars that have been, that have, that have taught me and have worked with me and that kind of thing, and I, I will do my best, but if you want this thing in raw form, you need to find out the Bible teaches the power of the blood and the precious blood, because I'm going to teach you about the gospel according to John, but we're going to do our best. Listen, he came to his own. And his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who, see now, in our language, in English language, believe is a noun, but John always uses it as a verb, as an action word, as something that you have to do. If you believe, anytime we hear in the next however many weeks we go through this thing, when you hear, if you believe, to it. It's one thing to believe but not have any action. John says when he believed, so listen and read it about it, so read it again. If, if conditional, all those people but to all who did receive him who put action in his name, he gave the right. What does it say there? Twelve. The power. That is the better translation here. The ecclesia. The power to become children. Now here is one way that we link the gospel. 
gospel writer of John to the first, second, and third epistle of John. Because we see this common terminology, all you little children. John commonly refers to God's people as the children of God. And everybody knows that children have entitlements to inheritance. you have been adopted. We have not been given the spirit of fear, but of power whereby we cry, Abba Father. If you read other translations, it says we not have the spirit of fear, but the, the, the spirit and the power of adoption. But I, 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 I did a thing, and it happened, right? Therefore, this is my duty because they're mine. But let me tell you something about adoption. It's not really my duty, but I'm going to step up to the plate anyway. See, really, your sin has separated you from God, and it's no longer his duty, but there is a love. The Bible says that's deeper than the grave, that's more jealous than the grave. And because of that, he's willing to adopt you. He's already done what he needs to do, but he goes the extra mile. So that's the power that John is painting for you, that he wants you to see. Children of God, 13, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but, let's read that all at one time, start at 11, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed he put action in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He was talking about a rebirth, which we'll get into it once we get to meet this man named Nicodemus. 14, my, one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. And the word became flesh. And in the Greek, when it tabernacled, it dwelt. Word become flesh and it dwelt, it tabernacled among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This is he of whom I speak. He who comes after me ranks before me because he. John was the oldest. That, that blew over some of you here. John, John, John the Baptist was the older cousin. He was the older second cousin of Jesus. But see, listen, John was sent in the spirit of Elijah. Isaiah 40 says that it's the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. He was the older of the two. But he says he came... Because he knows in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God is the Word. In the verse before it says, and the Word put on flesh, which means the man that put on flesh was the same man that spoke, that seen a void, and he spoke out into nothing. He outranks me, but because before he was there. I like it because as we get into the seven I am, a Pharisee says, are you greater than our father Father Abraham? And Jesus says, before Abraham was, I 
him. Abraham looked forward to my day, and he rejoiced when he seen it. Sixteen, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's <laughs> No one has ever seen God, the the only God who is at the Father's, he has made. He told Moses, he said, Moses, I'm going to need you to hide your face in the cleft of the rock. Moses said, why do I need to hide my face in the cleft of the rock? He says, because you've been a servant to me, I'm going to pass by your way. But you can't look upon me because if you do, you'll die. But God said, that's been long enough. I'm fixing to put on the form of man and let everybody behold me and know who I am. The only problem is they missed it. They missed it. says, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. 19, and this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny but confessed, get your pen ready, I am not the Christ. One, right there. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am, are you the prophet? And he answered, threefold repetition completely. Okay. Even the way that John the Baptist answered was kind of thrown off. Are you the Christ? No, man. Uh -uh. I am not the Christ. I am not. It, it's just a weird way of writing, especially if you see it in the Greek. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Write you a side note, Isaiah 40. See, in Isaiah 40, let's, I got to read this. Okay, I want to break this down just a little bit. Is that okay with y'all? They, they asked, he, before they could even ask, listen, he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. So they didn't really ask him, are you the Christ? They just said, who are you? And he went ahead and offered it up. I'm not the Christ. And then they said, are you the prophet? Which is, you need to circle that and write you a little note to the side, Deuteronomy 18. Because Moses told the people, you need to look for a prophet that looks like me. That's when you'll know the Mashiach, the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christos, has arrived on the scene. When you see a prophet that looks like me, he's here. And John the Baptist wasn't an ordinary guy. He was a preacher, man. He was a preacher. Unapologetically. We need some John the Baptist that ain't scared to offend and step on toes, right? Locked up several times, never shut his mouth, right? He was a preacher, and he was causing a big commotion. People were getting baptized. The Jews had a problem with the way he was baptizing people. But they asked him, are you the prophet? And what that meant when they asked, are you the prophet, was are you the Deuteronomy 18 prophet? Are you the one? And he says, no, nah, not even close. He said, I'm just the one making the way for him. Okay? Let's go on down. Um, where was that? He said, I'm the voice of crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. 24, now they had been sent from the Pharisees. See, here's the funny thing about it, too. If you really break down John the Baptist, his daddy was a priest. Which, 
don't have time to get into it, but only priests could serve from the tribe of Levi, the Levitical priesthood, okay? John was the bloodline to be a priest. He should have been in the synagogue. He should have been working at the temple, okay? And how many know that this probably made these folks that much more upset, right? So it says here that they, they were sent from the Pharisees. 25 says, they asked him then, why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize you with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. We're going to see this thing of John the Baptist, and if I call him the baptizer, okay, that's who I'm talking about, in the spirit of Elijah. Okay, hold on to that. All right, 29. Here we go. You ready? The next day, I want you to write above that day one. These are the little things that John writes in his book that we miss. The next day, day one, fix them, kick this thing off, right? The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him. John the Baptist did. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John is an average guy. Listen, John, is he don't have any supernatural powers. He's just led by the Spirit. He began to leap in his mother's womb when Mary came into the house. And from that day, he, he had an anointing on his life. But even the family of Jesus thought he was crazy at the beginning. I'll, and I'm, I'll prove it to you. But when he sees him, he calls him a lamb. Behold the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said. After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose. I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. Here we go. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove. Highlight, circle, and it remained on him. This was right after. See, there's a break in between 29 and 28. And what you do, and this is where it, it comes in very good to know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because if you know the other gospels, he was tempted in the wilderness. For who? 40 days, right? The children of Israel was in out of order for 40 years. Right. Then he come down. He was tested three different times. Hmm? You'll see throughout this gospel, the enemy comes to what? Kill, steal, kill, and destroy. Right. All three things line up with how Jesus was tempted, but or tested. But when he comes down, then God goes ahead and he anoints him. So we miss that in this gospel, but that's where it is. When John saw Jesus, he was coming to him, okay? Um, he said, I see the Spirit come down and remain on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to him, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. There in that word baptizing is talking about a washing, a purging. Okay, It's not talking about like Acts chapter 2. It's talking about a refreshing, bringing you out of that place that has separated you from God. 
34. And I have seen and bore witness that this is the Son of God. The next day, hmm? day two, that's right. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples and looked at Jesus, and he walked and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, where are, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come, and you will see. I want you to highlight that because that is one part of the bookend. Come, follow me. Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two heard John speak and followed Jesus. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own, I'm losing my spot, here we go. Simon Peter's brother, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Mashiach, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. Son of John. Everybody say that with me. Son of John. Because later in the gospel, Jesus calls him Simon, son of Jonah. And everybody's like, what? What are you talking about? He was John just a couple chapters ago. We'll make it make sense. You shall be called Cephas. The next day, three. What, what does three represent? Completion. So right day three above that. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. You know, we're fixing to kick this thing in over to where chapter 2 will begin. But listen, he says, Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus said to him, Before Philip ever called you, Now, now think about this, that, that the same one here, Nathaniel, he plays a key ingredient to this because he says to Andrew, what good can come out of Nazareth? And I want to I show you something of Jesus of Nazareth. We see this thing in Old Testament. The branch of David. The stump of Jesse. There'll come a branch. Well, if we look at this word Nazareth, write this down. Hebrew used this funny type of three, they had three symbols. They're really symbols. They're not letters. They call them letters, but they're 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 not letters. But every word in their etymology has three root, three roots. Okay, every semantic language is kind of built the same. I'm not, not very good at it, but I do know that every word has three. It's like an arpeggio. Where's Andrew? You got three chords that make up one chord, right? Hebrew Hebrew words are the same way. You got three basic root letters that make up. Here in Nazareth is N S R. Go write that down. Nazareth, the root, the etymology is N-S-R. Y'all know what N-S-R stands for? 
the branch. I mean, how, how can you get how can you get any better than that? That that Old Testament continually speaks of there'll be a branch of David, there'll be a branch, a stump of Jesse. Out of the branch, I'll bring a Messiah, and then Jesus of the branch shows up. So he says, hey, can anything good come from Bessemer City? I mean, <laughs> Sandy, where are you from? <laughs> Baby, where are you from? Bessemer. Bessemer. He said, man, wait a minute. You, you're telling me that you have found him, and he's from Bessemer. I got to put it in today's terms. Y'all got to get the full effect. Y'all don't know where Nazareth is. But if, if, if we said we found him, he lives down on airline. Y'all yeah, got the wrong one. So Nathaniel says that, and he says something. Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And we tie this in with Jacob because Jacob was deceitful with the help of his mother. And he conned his daddy into giving him the inheritance. After he done conned his starving brother into selling his birthright for a bowl of red soup. But he says, Nathaniel said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now that don't mean much to us. Don't mean much to us. But if we look at 2 Kings 4 and 22, it'll make more sense. 2 Kings 4 and 22. Listen to what it says here. 2 Kings in 22 somewhere in here might be 1 Kings 4 and 22 I should have got notes but I'm not going to do that 1 Kings 4 and 22 you ready? that's right Solomon's provision for one day was 30 cores of fine flour and 60 cores of meal blah 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 4 and 24 he had dominion over all the rest the region west of Euphrates from the Tifa to Gaza over all the kings west of Euphrates and he had peace on all sides around him. And Judah and Israel lived in safety from Dan even to Beersheba. Every man under his vine and under his fig tree. So Really, if we look at this, do we say that God, that Jesus really seen him sitting under a literal fig tree? Or are we moving more into a metaphorical thing that I seen you? I'm, I, listen. He says before the man even told you to come find me, I've already seen you sitting in a place of peace. Do y'all remember the chosen? Nathaniel was the guy that killed everybody when his building fell down. Okay? And he was distressed. And the show was trying to show you that he was in a state of distress. But then Jesus seen him coming. And he says, wait a minute, you're not a liar. Here's an Israelite who has no deceit. He says, how do you even know me? He said, brother, before the man even called you to hear, I've already seen you sitting See, Jesus, I tell people all the time, God was with you. Listen, I was born April 17th, 1988 in Rutherford Hospital. Praise God, I made it. They don't even let you put Band-Aids on over there anymore. They will let you go there for a colonoscopy. I'm, that's about all they do there now. It's not a pleasant place, Brother Rob. Deanna, I don't know when God will call me home. But here's the beautiful thing about it. 
God still in 1988 when I was born. But he's also already where I am when I'll draw my last breath. So he tells Nathaniel, hey, I seen you under the fig tree. Write down Zechariah 3 and 6, Micah 4. Learn more about the fig tree. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? And Jesus said, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Now, what, that, that was kind of a flip there. Now, the man from Bessemer, and he says, see, Nathaniel understood he's not talking about a physical thing. He's talking in the spiritual because anybody could have seen him sitting under a fig tree, right? But it takes a special somebody to look further into the things of the spirit because all he had to say was, Nathaniel, I've seen where you're at. And then he changes his tune and says, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Here we go. And Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. Are you ready? I'm going to close right here. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened. And the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Would you stand? Let's close. How do we tie this to Jacob and how do we know that that's who he's referring to? Right? Come on, Jesse, get on the keyboard for me. Or Deanna, let Deanna come play. Deanna, come play. You can get on both soon. Come on up here, Deanna, play the keys for us. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Genesis 28. I just want to read this to you just real quick. And this is how we tied Jacob. This section that we're going into here. Listen. Jacob had a dream. It's called Jacob's Ladder. Jacob left Bersheba and went, to, went toward Haran and came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth. And the top of it reached to heaven. I want y'all to listen. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, Yahweh stood above it and said, I am Yahweh, the Elohim of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Skip down to verse number 16. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely Yahweh is in this place, and I did not know it. Jesus comes, and he tells Nathaniel, who doubted him. He said, Hey, look, man. If you believe me over just that, you're going to see a whole lot better things than that. Matter of fact, that same ladder that Jacob seen stretching from the earth to heaven, I am the ladder. I'm him. And see, we miss these things because we don't we, we just don't know our Bible. I mean, I wish I could sugarcoat it. We just don't know. But Jesus was telling everybody standing around there that day, I am the point of access. I am the portal from this side to that side. No man comes to the Father except through me. 
And he shows us, Brother Mike, that he's come. We're going to see a shift begin to happen. A turning. I'm going to show you how all these men that he called were nobodies. Brother Mikey, he didn't go to the temple. He didn't go to the finest restaurants in Jerusalem. He went to where the men was working. And he found Peter naked. Fishing. And he said, come be fishers of men. I want to show you through the Gospel of John here in the next few weeks that the love of Christ supersedes anything that is material, any of your talent, any of your abilities, anything that you have done in your past or you will ever do in your future. The love of Christ supersedes all of it. And he's still the ladder that Jacob saw. Can you believe that? Thousands of years before he would ever put on flesh. Because why? He was there that day when Jacob was dreaming Caleb. That was him in Jacob's mind. Now he's just wrapped himself in flesh. My God. Father, I thank you tonight. That in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with you. And you was the Word. Father, and I thank you for that 14th verse that says, And you put on flesh, and you dwelled with us. Father, I thank you that just like Nathaniel, you've also seen us sitting under a fig tree in a place of peace, God, and comfort, Lord. Father, and we understand that you are the only way. But Lord, I just ask that you would continue to do new things in everybody's life. Father, you're still creating new things. You're still doing new things. You're still moving things. Father, and we thank you for that. As Jesse begins to sing or whatever he's going to do, just sing some hallelujahs or something, Jesse. You ain't got This is what I want you to do. I just want you to lift up your hand tonight. And here's my prayer for each and everybody. Father, I pray right now, God, that you would give these people wisdom, that you would give them a hunger for your word, that you would give them a knowledge of your word, God. Father, your word tells us that the lack of knowledge would be the death of your people. Father, give them wisdom. Solomon asked for wisdom and you said because you asked for wisdom I'm going to add everything else to you Father we pray the prayer of Solomon tonight God that you would just increase our wisdom let us learn you God Father let us learn who you are I love you Father in the mighty name of Jesus and everybody said Amen come on give the Lord some praise I think one thing that we have done wrong in the Pentecostal church, um, and you can be seated, I know Liz has probably got a lot of things to say, but one thing that we have done wrong, Brooklyn, it really happened in the 90s, we got so worked up on how we look. Y'all know what I'm talking about, that word of faith movement and we forgot to learn the Bible. And we lost touch. Look, it's easy for me to come in here and get y'all worked up. And that, that, that does move you, right? But every now and then, we got to have the meat. We got to have something we can stand on. We got to have substance. Jesus in his commission didn't say go and hype the people. He said go and disciple and make disciples. Brother Mikey, we can have a sword all day and be the best swordsman on earth but if our sword ain't got no edge on it you ain't cutting nothing so I'm trying and it's tough on the old Pentecostal boy I'm trying to be a teacher I try to be a teacher so my 
my homework for you tonight. I go to summer school. I was the first one on the road, boy. Every year, summer school. My daddy just went ahead. He went ahead and made plans. Well, you got summer school, do I? I bet so. Here's my here's my my homework for you. Read John one again, and then read it again, and read it as many times as you can. And I promise you, each time you read it. The reason they call this the living word is because it speaks every time you open the pages of it. And I've never read it and got the same thing over and over again. I always get a new revelation. But listen, guys, I'm the pastor, I'm the preacher, but I can't be the only one to give you the Bible in your life. Sometimes Paul said uh, uh, that he searched the scriptures daily. Study to show thyself approved. So just read John 1 and 1. If you don't read nothing else, John 1 and 1. And I love you. Pray for everybody that's sick. Elizabeth, you don't get a turn tonight. I'm the pastor. I say so. Now, what you got? I'm sorry.